Hello and welcome to another edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. I'm Captain Rick Riles. Hey, we're going to have a good time. We're going to take a trip around the state of Florida this evening. But first, we're going to make a quick trip over to Nassara, Costa Rica and check in with Nassara Paradise Rentals, our buddy Craig Sutton, and find out if the billfish have showed up there again this week. Then we'll come back to the northeast corner of the state with David Borries and work our way all the way around out the panhandle with Tyler Massey. Our trip this evening is going to be sponsored by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. By Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. By Nassara, Paradise Fishing, your dream vacation. And by Young Boats. You want the finest in flat spay and offshore hybrids? You need to check out youngboats.com. All right, our first stop tonight is going to be in beautiful Nassara, Costa Rica, which I think about a whole lot more since I started getting myself set up for another week there in August. Can you handle it? Hey, man, glad to talk to you. I'm ready to get back down there. I couldn't stand going through this latest blow without making a reservation for Nassara. It gives me something to look forward to. Well, brother, man, let me tell you something. I just got home Saturday night. I fished six days. And they were, it was absolutely the most, the longest string of just ravenous bites. I mean, crazy yellowfin everywhere. I'll be darned. I mean, you could have caught a hundred of them if you wanted to. Wow. I mean, we were stopping at 10 and some days we'd stop at eight or nine, but we were getting, you know, we got a 54, a 42. I lost one at the boat, and I'm talking about a couple feet from the boat. We saw him really, really good, at well over the 160 pound mark. Mm, I mean, mm, a big one. Mm. And you know, we week before last, we caught that one. We're calling about 180, 185, a 71 inch fish, and we got the photos. But it just it the and the sailfish are everywhere. The the real consistent, but the sailfish are mixed in with the tuna, and the and the they're just not having enough time to, to get to the bait. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, we changed our presentation a couple times, went to a, a strictly bait-and-switch presentation, and the sailfish, the sailfish are hitting the teasers, and it's just crazy. I mean, we had some – we had a, a one pod. It was, this was Wednesday. We pull up to it, the porpoise school. We got four lines out. All four go off, and we all saw it. The captain, the mate, me and my, my buddy Billy was, were fighting fish. This this yellowfin, about anywhere from 150, maybe two plus, he pops up 30 feet away. We see his forehead charging the teaser. Teaser's got a ballyhoo behind a blue and white islander. He hits the ballyhoo and buries it. It starts running drag off the, the teaser reel, and, it, and there's no hook in the ballyhoo. Ricky, none, and he literally destroys a 250-pound snap pool. We lose the the lure, of course, the ballyhoo, and the and the squids. And wow, fire. it was crazy. wow. And I, I don't know how he could sink it to the point of he broke. And it, we only use sampo snap pools. This isn't a junk swivel. I'll be I mean, it was it was it was totally sprung. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah, it, was just, it was sick fish. And the only thing I would say bad about it right now is the marlin are around, but they're just, they, again, you're having trouble targeting just them because they're mixed in with the porpoise schools. And there was a few caught, but, you know, not. A, I mean, I didn't get one, and I never saw one, but the wanderer on Tuesday had one about two miles away from us, a nice, you know, nice blue, about 350. Gotcha. Oh, that's outstanding, Craig. How how are your bookings coming? You getting filled up? We're doing all right. We had a goose in November, but we still got space for, for December and January, which normally we'd be a hundred percent booked. We wouldn't have anything open, but we got you know, we had those new units come online that are we're gonna start renting here in the next two weeks and and so that adds a little more, you know, opportunities for people, but we we still got Got well, you know, guys it's, it's need to of- guys need to finish this lousy year with the fishing trip of a lifetime by going fishing by going to fishingnasar don't they? Oh yeah, yeah. We'll we'll we'll, we'll give them we'll give them the world class fishing, Ricky, like like a lot of places can. But we'll give them an experience when they get off the boat from the people, the nature, the culture, the architecture, the wildlife, and a community that really separates us from any place else. 
Buddy, I loved every minute of it, and I'm counting the days until I'll be back down there again. I'm bringing some Yamaha Likewise. people and my oldest stepson. We're going to have a great time. Awesome, man. Can't wait, Ricky. Thank Can't you, Craigie. Wait. Talk to you next week. All right, y'all have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, our thanks to Craig Sutton for giving us a great little fantasy shot there of what life's like in paradise. They are covered up in yellowfin tuna with plenty of sailfish to go with them. Now, let's do Florida. Let's get started up in the northeast corner with our buddy, Captain David Borries. David, what's biting in northeast Florida? Hey, buddy, the inshore right now, things a little shut down right now because of the winds and the temperatures. But let me tell you, early this week, it's been on fire uh, redfish, trout, flounder, a little bit of just everything is still biting. But our trout have really, our, our good size uh, winter trout are starting to show up. Had a couple of really good days this week where we went out and probably had well over 10 to 12 keeper trout. And I'm talking 16, 17, 18 inchers. And, uh, you know, basically went out, found the birds working fished under the birds we could see shrimp coming up to the surface and the seagulls were diving down uh, uh snatching up the shrimp and all we had to do was throw up under them and it was uh hook up on every cast um the redfish this week had just been incredible early in the morning on that incoming high tide up against the grass we've had phenomenal days this week uh, where we just basically uh, I, I had one charter this week uh, with a gentleman, uh, one guy uh, from Buffalo, New York, uh, came down here, and he had his limit on tr- uh, redfish on two shrimp and two casts. <laughs> That's pretty right good. That's pretty good. Yep, darn right. Now, and David, you, help- Rick, you know how you know how we set, how, sort of have to think that well, you know, hey. You know, don't catch a fish on your first cast. I said, oh, no, that's bad luck. Well, he put it, put a shrimp on, flipped over again, and boom, hooked a second 25, 26-inch red. And uh, two shrimp, two reds, and he was limited out. Okay. I need your help now. And and, and we're starting to hear this from our, our listeners. We talk a lot about how many fish we're catching and not enough about how we're doing it. What are you doing red fishing on a high tide early in the morning? What's your go-to? What I'm doing is I'm sticking with the shrimp. They want shrimp. I haven't had a lot of luck on the mud minnows right now, but I'm seeing a lot of shrimp. What I'm doing is working right up close along the grass edges. Again, I'm looking for points, but what I really like are areas that I know are full of oysters. And these are areas you find them at low tide and you come back on the high water and you fish them. And I like to be within a foot of the grass, and I tell my clients I'd rather you be thrown into the grass than not far enough. And uh, right up against the grass, they they hug that grass, and a lot of times, um, you know, all you feel is a little thump, thump on the end of your line, and you better set the hook because I guarantee it's going to be a nice red. Now, are you fishing with a jig head, or how are you fishing? Quarter ounce jig head. Yep, yep. yep. And a live uh, shrimp. I'm using uh, new concept lures on a, with a live shrimp. And the way I rig my shrimp is and through the tail. And uh, so I'll make them look as natural as possible. You know, a lot of people tend to think, you know, fishing with live bait is you just put, a, you just put the bait on the hook and you toss it out there. You know what? It, that, that could be further from the truth. It's very important to give that shrimp a natural presentation. And the way I like to hook my shrimp, Rick, is through the last segment of the tail, I bring the hook from the back of the shrimp at the end of the very last segment, and I go straight down all the way through his tail and run him up the hook shank. Then I turn the hook forward towards the front of the shrimp. So I cut the second time I hook this shrimp, I do a double hook on these guys. I go up through his belly and completely out his back, keeping everything down that center line down the back of the shrimp and I want that barb to come completely out of the shrimp so it's completely exposed Perfect. and that makes your shrimp right through the water upright makes him look natural and it makes it look like he's getting out of the way when he's when they shoot backwards perfect perfect yeah a lot of people don't understand shrimp 
when they're in peril, when they're threatened, they sh- they swim backwards. They swim that way much faster by snapping and propelling right. themselves backwards than they do going forward. David, that's great. You got hey, you want to hear about offshore? Rick, I saw some guys at the station cleaning station the other day. They had a cobia, they had a wahoo, and they had three mahu, uh, mahi, and they said they didn't have to go very far. So tell me a story, Rick. Wow, I tell you what, that's that's pretty good fishing. It it sounds to me like they were probably in the forty mile range, probably about one hundred ten to one hundred and thirty feet. But for the boats that are going on further from 140 out to 200 feet, it's the best stretch of blackfin tuna fishing I've ever seen. In fact, our buddy Captain Craig Sutton reported two yellowfin tuna yesterday, which is pretty unusual um, for for our area. We used to get a lot of them, David, and then we got to where we got very few, and now it looks like they're making a little bit of a comeback. But the big story was almost every boat at the ledge was limited on blackfin tuna. That's 10 per boat. That is outstanding fishing. Also, limit catches of triggerfish, a lot of triggerfish in the 130-foot range. Offshore fishing has been fantastic, but, David, I don't see anybody getting back out there until at least next Thursday or Friday. Yeah, this blow is going to keep even some of the inshore guys down, at least today and tomorrow. Looks like it's going to start laying down about maybe midday tomorrow, but I'm still thinking it's it's going to be uh, Wednesday and Thursday before we get out and start fishing again. I'm with you. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate it. Please tell me we can talk to you next week. Absolutely, Rick, and I'm looking forward to it, buddy, and tight lines, everybody. Thank you, David. Our thanks to Captain David Borries for the great news from Northeast Florida. Both inshore and offshore were hot over the weekend. Let's travel on down the road a little bit and pull over and check on our buddy Jim Ross. Jim, how you doing? Doing fantastic, Rick. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Did you make it out this weekend? I got a couple of days out this week, and uh, it was pretty good. Uh, the areas I fished, I fished the Bastion. We had some uh, pompano again. We had uh, trout. We had snook. We had... Um, Jack Creval, ladyfish, good mixed bag down there uh, in the Indian River. Uh, up to the north, I also fished out of Canaveral and uh, big bulls, you know, big bulls, sharks. Uh, my son Justin also had a couple of trips hit pompano, whiting jacks, ladyfish, monster ladyfish. Some of these ladyfish are going four and a half, five pounds. That's a bad and, animal uh, right there. Yeah, like catching little skinny, skinny turbocharged tarpon almost, you know, because um, they fight, they fight better than a tarpon of the same size. But here's what else we've got going on. We've got, we got before we head offshore, we've got to talk about what's going on inshore. We've had this algae bloom. Like I, I, you've heard in the past, it looks like nuclear waste. Well, unfortunately, that stuff is starting to die now. And it is creating a huge problem in the Indian River from Rockledge all the way north to Titusville at this point. Uh, a lot of fish are dying, big fish kill going on. Hopefully it won't last too much. Hopefully today's front, coming through is going to bring some northwest winds the next couple of days north northwest winds and really oxygenate aerate that water with you know with good wave action uh we haven't had a whole lot of wave action here the last four or five days that dissolved oxygen level went below um the you know the threshold of the fish and i was out saturday running a 36 footer up and down the, the icw just trying to get the motor synchronized and and uh it was it was not good. It was not good. A lot of dead fish. Mm. So if you're looking to fish in the Central East region right now, push over to the Mosquito Lagoon side. They, we we haven't seen any fish kills yet over there, or get down towards Melbourne and South to Sebastian and, and Wabasso and Vero. Those areas still seem to be pretty darn darn good. Now, with that bad news being said. Um, you know, and it's an unfortunate thing, uh, but we've also had a really good offshore bite that's the last two days, Saturday, uh, Sunday, and even into, even into today, um, we had a really good offshore bite, uh, with mutton snapper, mangrove snapper, of course, the 9 million red snapper that you get in conjunction with trying to catch those other two, the, the pink porgies, pink snapper, red porgies, whatever you want to call those things, um, really good bite on them. Cobia showing up, kingfish showing up. Even some dolphin, wahoo. Actually, the wahoo bite was surprising yesterday, Sunday. was surprising out on the 27 Fathom and uh, Ridge and the Cone. So um, we're starting to see some of those pelagics push back into the area. Obviously, this front 
is going to be a big driver. It's going to push a lot of stuff from the Carolinas south. And so you'll probably start seeing uh, even more of them, uh, you know, even with, even though you had a great report up there. And we're looking forward to seeing more of them down here. Now, this time of the year, one of the things that I really like to catch is the cobia. And with that mullet run, just the tail end of the mullet run still going on, we get cobia along the beaches sometimes. Wow. So as you guys are running offshore, especially around the tip of Cape Canaveral, you know, keep an eye out on the water. If you see any flotsam, any weed patches, stop and check them out because you'd be surprised at how many cobia you can find this time of the year. And then once our water temperature drops below 72 degrees, the triple tail are going to start showing up really, really strong. And, of course, that's one of my favorite fish to catch. I actually caught a world record triple tail on fly um, one time. And, and so just, just a fun fish to chase and, a, and an even better one to, to eat, to be honest with you. Oh, that's for sure. Hey, Jimmy, when you get on those pompano, what is your go-to pompano bait and method? Well, it's either a sand flea on a very short shank jig head. I found um, Saltwater Assassin makes a 2 aught sized hook in a quarter and three eighths ounce size. Mm -hmm. And you can cast those and kind of get below the wave action. If you're fishing just outside the surf, cause I'm typically fishing from a boat back towards the surf, or if they push out, sometimes Pompano, they'll not sit right on the outside edge of the surf break. They'll actually push offshore and get in like 15 or 20 feet of water and school up out there, especially on your lower stages of the tide around the Canaveral bite area. And that's enough weight that you can get that sand flea down to them. Now, I also like goofy jigs, and especially when I'm fishing in the river, I really like fishing goofy jigs or down at Sebastian Inlet. Those are, those are my, my favorite type of jig. And those goofy jigs, unlike a standard jig that you would put a soft plastic on, like I was mentioning with, for, to put the sand flea on, um, the goofy jigs fall backwards. And I really, really like to run a feather on that jig. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can buy them with or without. And if you look around for your pompano jigs, Personally, I like the ones with a feather, and I take a small fish of a uh, small piece of fish bite, and I tip it just a very small piece on there on that feather. And nine times out of ten, the fish hit the feather on the drop. Gotcha. Uh, that's excellent advice. That's just what we like to give out. Outstanding, Jimmy. Yeah, I think you got uh, you got plenty of blackfin tuna headed your way, and some uh, even a few yellowfin tuna. It looks like we had some of them show up over here over the weekend. Really. So, I think once we get another calm stretch, when who knows when that'll be, but when we do, I think your <laughs> offshore fishing will get even better. Well, you know, it, ideally for the guys that are charter fishing, they want to be calm all week and blow on the weekend. Right. Um, but for Joe Average, recreational angler that's got a nine to fiver, you know, he's looking for that calm spell on the weekend. And I think with the way the fronts are pushing through at this particular time, I think next weekend is probably going to be our first opportunity to get back out there. Mm, plenty of us chomping to go. Thank you, Jimmy. Please tell me we can talk with you next week. I look forward to it, Rick. All right. Captain Jim Ross from the East Central area. All right. Thanks to Captain Jim Ross for a great East Central report. Now, let's drive on down south to Stewart, Florida, one of my favorite little fishing villages, and check in with Captain John Earhart from the Chaos and the Mayhem. John, how are you? I'm good. Glad to be here. Good. Glad to have you, buddy. Hey, I tell you what, we got a calm weekend up here last weekend. Did you guys get one down there? Yeah, we uh, we had we had a little bit of fishable offshore weather. You know, it was kind of nice to get a break from all this wind. That's that's for sure. How'd you do? So, so the uh, the offshore fishing was actually really good. We had we had a nice run of mahi. You know, and that was about a hundred to hundred and fifty feet of water. Guys were catching a couple of sailfish here and there. Uh, over the past couple of days, we've been catching a lot of wahoo right out in front of the St. Lucie Inlet, which is uh, it's a pleasant surprise, but it's kind of expected right around the full moon. So if you uh, if you have the tackle and the time and you're willing to high-speed troll right now, chances are you're going to go out and catch a couple of wahoo. You know, and that, that's been anywhere from 90 out to about 370 feet of water. And like I said, you know, you're, you're trolling for a while, but typically you're going to be re rewarded with a couple of wahoo. And they've been 30 to 50 pounds recently is what I've been seeing online. So that, you know, that's something else you can do while you're out there and you can stop and uh, they're catching some golden tile fish as well in the deeper water. A lot of vermilion snappers still. So, you know, there's been some pretty good action out front offshore. Yeah, I've talked with a buddy of mine out of Jupiter that's done really well on golden tiles and said this is the time of year for your deep dropping down there. Do you do any of that? Yeah, 
yeah, that's pretty common. You know, just outside Push Button Hill, there's a there's a lot of little areas where you can catch golden tilefish. You know, they're, they average about five pounds, but every now and then you'll catch the 15, 20 pounders, and you know that's that's definitely a a nice surprise when you get one of those bigger ones and it pops up on the surface of the water and they, they taste really good. Oh, they, they like taste so good. Yep. Taste so good. What's going on inshore? Is there any snook left? Yeah. The, uh, the inshore fishing has actually been pretty darn good for snook. We've got a lot of freshwater runoff. Still, and I think that's actually keeping the water temperatures up for this time of year. So it's actually made for some incredibly good snook fishing. Most of the guides, including myself are catching 15 to 30 snook a trip, which is um, kind of unusual for this time of year. You know, typically I go out and I might catch five or 10 snook on a good day, but everybody seems to be doing consistent, you know, about 15 or 20 fish a trip right now. So, you know, we got, we got about 15 more days before season ends and I don't see any cold wa water in sight in the next 15 days. So chances are you're going to be able to go out and catch keeper snook right up until the end of season with relatively good success. You know, we're seeing a few pompano mixed in as well. A lot of black drum, sheep fed, some triple tail. Uh, I've been catching a lot of redfish this week also, which has been a nice bonus. So we've had some really good inshore fishing as well. You know, good fishing all around in Stewart right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, are there enough mullet left to catch to snook fish with, or what have you been using for bait? There's been a lot of mullet around, believe it or not. They've been larger mullet, the, you know, 6 to 10-inch mullet. But, you know, you're going to get your bigger snook with those. Uh, there's been some pilchards around. That's what a lot of these guys are using right now, pilchards and mohars. Uh, with the pilchards and the mohars, since they're smaller, you're going to have to catch a lot of smaller snook to catch one that's in that slot size. Right. But, you know, you're going to have a lot of action with the smaller bait. You know, so that isn't necessarily a bad thing. No, that'll work. That'll absolutely work. Well, John, that's fantastic. We appreciate the heck out of report. And if it's okay with you, we look forward to talking with you next week. Yes, sir. I look forward to talking to you next week. All right. Thank you, John. Captain John Earhart from the southeast section of Florida. Hey, listen, John, along with all our action spotters, is brought to you each and every week by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. By Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. By Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation. And by Young Boats. You want the finest in flat Spain offshore hybrids? You need to check out youngboats.com. Okay, it's time to go to Miami. Let's see what Alan Sherman's up to. Mayor Sherman, how are you? <laughs> Mayor Sherman, I'm good. Okay. Um, I, uh, I was a little wet a little while ago because that front just now started pushing through. And uh, the rains have been threatening us for the last couple of hours. But uh, it did come down before I got into the house, so I got soaked. <laughs> but, um, now it stopped. Now, well, that stopped. figures. Yep, that figures. Yeah. God doesn't have that. anything to punish you for right now. It's not going to rain. So <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you a question. Where are you right now? Are you up in Jacksonville? Yes, sir, I am. And is it chilly? Yes, sir, it is. <laughs> well, it's not chilly here yet. It, it Actually, at one point today, it got really hot. It was probably in the mid-80s. Uh, but I know it's supposed to uh, start... Uh, changing here probably by tomorrow morning we'll start seeing the colder temperatures come in uh fishing today was as good as it gets uh, maybe you know it's because of a, a you know free front bite uh possibly but i found a little rock in like 20 feet of water for my guy and uh, we had grouper action one after another for a few hours uh, mostly gag groupers a couple of black groupers no legal fish but you know good action and then another 15 or so mutton snappers Ooh. again no legal fish up to maybe stay 16 inches uh -huh. uh, a little bit of juvenile kingfish action and uh blue runners and yellow jacks so uh the fishing really was outstanding um and, and it wasn't a beautiful day because we had quite a bit of wind we had that south southwest wind today I just got off the phone with a buddy of mine who fished Flamingo today, and he was in that south southwest wind, and he said it was cranking. And the guys over the weekend did really well up on the flats in, in uh, Florida Bay on the reds and the snook. The fish were sitting in the potholes, and they were throwing soft plastics at them. And uh, these were really, you know, the snook were slot-sized fish, and the reds were 
maybe even oversized fish, uh, but, but a lot of action. My buddy today, he got into some action on the outside, but the water was so dirty, he pulled the boat out of the water, put it on the inside, and then he slayed the snook. Uh, he told me he must have ended up with like 40, 40 snook and wow. uh, 25 sea trout. Wow. Uh, so a lot of action. It's been um, a good year. Yeah, All, it's been a good year from Jacksonville to the Keys for snook. It's just been a good snook year. Alan, you mentioned a paddle tail. What's your go-to paddle tail for snook? Well, I, I, I fish a couple of different baits. I, I like the gulp shrimp. Um, and, uh, the three inch and the four inch, uh, especially coming into this time of the year as it starts to get cooler and, you know, we turn more towards fishing with shrimp or shrimp imp- imitations. Otherwise I fish a lot of, uh, baits made by, uh, savage, uh, gear and, and they're, they're not necessarily paddle tails. They're actually imitation fish and, uh, they work really well. Otherwise, I'll use a hookup lure, jig head, quarter ounce, three eighth ounce, and uh, you know, white a white paddle tail or a bait fish tail uh, is always a good one for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. All right. Did you hear anything much from the offshore guys from the weekend? I think it was pretty calm, wasn't it? They had a beautiful weekend, and uh, the bottom fishing was was exceptional. Nighttime, they they were slayed the uh, yellowtail snappers, and during the daytime, the, they're catching muttons and, and uh, re- a lot of red groupers. Not so many gags or blacks, but a lot of red groupers and legal fish. Hmm. Um, there was also uh, a lot of vermilion and, and yellow-eyed snappers. Uh, Wayne Con on the reward. He ran what they call a uh, Iron Man trip, where they do a lot of vertical jigging uh-huh. over the wrecks, and they had they had three uh, like seven to ten pound um, genuine red snappers caught in state waters. I uh, see. So you're able to keep them here in state waters, um, and then they also had a, a lot of Almaco jacks, amber jacks, blackfin tunas, and there's been quite a few kingfish and sailfish around as well. So. The offshore bite's been pretty good. Neat thing about this time of the year is, you know, you're fishing in anywhere from 100 to 300 feet of water, and the dolphin come right into you. Good now, deal. that's going to change now that we've got this wind coming out of the west. That'll blow the uh, blue water offshore, and the dolphin will go, off, go further out as well. Uh, but once the, you know, the winds get back into the northeast, we'll see those fish come back in again. You know, it's always nice to be able to catch golfing while you're sail fishing and king fishing. That's and for sure. Fishing, uh, <laughs> That's for where, sure. Where you don't have to just target them. Yep. You know, you're here, you're getting everything. But uh, yeah, the action's good. You know, even on the beaches, there's been mackerel and bluefish around. Now, are the, so the guys that are complain. targeting, are the guys that are targeting sailfish, Alan, are they fishing live baits or are they trolling? No, they're fishing live baits. I you see. Know, there are a few times of the year when the guys will troll ballyhoos, but for the, the the bulk of the year, they're they're putting baits underneath the kites and yep. you know multiple baits. You know whether it be goggle eyes or threadfin herring or giant pilchards, big Spanish sardines. You know that's the kind of baits that they're looking to put uh, under a kite, and uh, that's how they, they fish them down here. Gotcha. Oh, that's cool. That's outstanding report, Alan. We appreciate it so much. Please tell me we can check with you next week. Most definitely. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Captain Alan Sherman, the mayor of Miami, and uh, they have been (laughs) on the bite down there. You know what Yamaha Outboards love? The genuine formula and consistency of Yamalu marine engine oils. Blood, 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 blood. Outboards are subjected to punishing conditions like high loads, salt, and humidity, a mix that automotive oils can't handle. Yamalu full synthetic and marine performance formulas are certified to protect against friction and corrosion for reliable performance every time. Ah. Find Yamalu marine oils at your nearest Yamaha Outboard dealer. Locate them at yamahaoutboards.com backslash dealers. Yamaha. Reliability starts here. 
Dodge, you know, being consistent is a mark of a quality product. If you've been Florida's number one chum for over 10 years, there's got to be a reason. For 10 years, Tournament Master Chum has lived up to his name. That's why more tournament pros insist on Tournament Master than any other chum. It's the only chum with Menhaden milk mixed right in. That means it gets a scent out faster and deeper than any other brand of chum. It comes in a grind size for every species from kingfish to catch and bait. Your fishing time is way too precious to you second-rate chum. Bring the action to you by insisting on Tournament Master Chum. It's worth every penny. When you're ready for the finest in custom-made flat spay or inshore-offshore hybrids, you are ready to meet the Young family in Inglis, Florida. For over 21 years, the Young family has built custom boats one at a time for every type of fishing. Nothing can sneak up on a flat quite like the Gulf Shore flats boats, and I've never fished a better hybrid than the Young 24s and 27s. Rob Young is a naval architect who takes tremendous pride in each and every build for each and every customer that wants their boat custom-built exactly the way they want want it. Is it time for you to move up? Are you ready to own the finest boat built? Then you need to visit the Young Boat facility in Inglis, Florida, or check them out online at youngboats.com. Our thanks to Alan for a great report. Now let's head on down south to Kokomo, Ala Mirada, and check in with our buddy, Captain Nick Stanzik. How you doing? Doing fine. How's that new baby doing? Uh, she's doing good. <laughs> good, good. I'm sure you're not getting a lot of sleep. Are you getting in any fishing? I uh, haven't fished much the last couple of weeks, but I did fish last Friday and Saturday. And Friday we caught a couple of swordfish and uh, lost the third one. What we kept for dinner. Not a huge fish, you know, maybe 75 pounds. But we also had a couple of queen snappers and had a nice yellow head grouper. So that was a uh, good eat. That's and a good day. On Saturday. Yeah, we were I fished on Saturday and we sword fished all day. It was slow. We missed one bite. We said we were going to fish till 2 p.m. at 1.59. We hooked up. I was like, hallelujah. And I uh, thought we had a Hail Mary. Plus the hook pulled about two minutes later. So <sighs> that was that. But we did catch a few bottom fish on my home. We caught a couple of scamp grouper, uh, a few yellow eye snapper, a few blackfin snapper, and a couple of schooly mahi. So we, we covered dinner at least. That's a fine dinner. There ain't nothing wrong with that dinner, Cap. Have you heard anything yeah. from inshore at all? Um, Charles Hotel, he just sent me a bunch of pictures. There's been a ton of smoke around and a lot of mangrove snappers. So those snappers, they're getting around all the islands again. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of the guys are catching all those nice, not, they're not huge mangrove snappers, but nice keepers, you know, 12 to 16 inches, um, along all the mangroves about the islands and the channels back there. So that's good too. Hey, Nick, I got a question for you. I, Everywhere up and down the coast, it seems like it's just been a phenomenal year for blackfin tuna. I know our boats um, out of here over the weekend were just limited out in no time and doing great on nice fish, too. Could the limit be having an effect that soon, or did are we just getting lucky this year and hitting a good year? I don't think the limit would affect them that quick. I mean, it would be great yeah. if it did. Maybe it did, but uh, I think it's just a good year on them. A lot of fish. There's blackfin tuna here. I'm on the reef. You know, there's been uh, my uncle had seven sailfish the other day too. So there's some sails showing Woo! up. Nice but uh, you know, they hooked a bunch of tunas on one of the humps again. The sharks just they moved back in. I thought they were gone. And every tuna they hooked, the sharks ate, and then they just left. You know, after they lost six or seven. Um, I did see a few tunas caught out there though. So you just, the sharks are kind of a nuisance again the whole time being. Man, we got to do something. I don't know what it is, but somehow we got to get sharks back in balance. I mean, they're just they're yeah. they're way out of balance right now. And I I don't know. And feel free to give me your thoughts on this. Are there that many more sharks, or have sharks just figured out what fishing boats are all about? I think both. You know, I think globally there's probably a shark shortage and some problems. But I know in South Florida we had never seen so many sharks now, and. Uh, they're probably learning and being trained, I believe, like you said, getting used to the boat noises, but we've never seen nothing like it for the last couple of years, you know. That's all my life. I'm with I've you. I've never seen them like they have the last few years. So. No, I've never seen them like they have been lately, but hey, we got to roll with it. That's all we can do. Cap, congratulations on your baby, and we look forward to talking with you next week, if that's okay. Yep, sounds good. We'll be here. Okay, thanks so much. Captain Nick Stanzik from the Broad-Minded out of Bud and Mary's. All right, time to make the big turn. We're going to make a swing around and check in with our man in 10,000 Islands, Captain Steve Dahl. A whole heck of a lot this week. I yep. can tell you that. It's been 
Yeah. It's, uh, I don't even know where to start. Where do you want to start? Throw me a topic and I got an answer. This okay, week. good. Because, <laughs> because for some reason I've been, I've been thinking about you a lot today and, and so many songs keep coming to mind, you know, like hooked on a feeling and, you know, hooked on you and, and I, I, I don't know what all that's about. Why, why would I be thinking that way? Well, you might know that because we were talking, uh, my 26th year of, uh, taking people fishing proudly. And I've, uh, in my career, I've been, I've been hooked three times by customers and yesterday was number three. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, I caught a, uh, you know, and, it, and honestly, it's, you know, this is a perfect example. Like, I, I, I want to talk about this just for a little bit. Um, it's kind of like a little PSA. And, you know, you know, there's so many things you could do to prevent getting hooked. And But sometimes it just happens. You spend enough time around this stuff. Uh, it's going to happen, you know. And, Rick, I'm sure you've had a hook in your hand. Oh, yeah. Somewhere else. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'd personally rather myself have one than a customer. And, uh, yes, it was my fault. I was taking off the fish and uh, didn't have slack line in the, uh, you know, in the working end of everything. Mm-hmm. And he had a slight bend in his rod. And once that fish became de hooked, that, that acts like a spring. And it went right into my um uh, fortunately, it went into a really good part of my finger, uh, a real meaty part. But I think this is where I think people got to heed a little caution. I think there's a lot of information about there how to safely remove hooks from people. And until you're in that situation, <laughs> you don't really know what you're working with. And you could do a lot of damage to yourself or someone else if you don't do it correctly. Um, I've got a little experience around it. I was confident it was myself yesterday. Uh, mine was embedded in my finger, uh, the, and the tip of uh, the hook wasn't too far from popping out the other end. So I forced it through Ow. and was able to cut it and slide it back out, which Ow. is not fun. No. Um, it really doesn't hurt all that much going in, but uh, once you're trying to pop it back out, it hurts like that. Mm. So. My, my point is, I guess, especially you can do a lot of damage. Seek medical attention. Don't be a hero. Um, I kind of put up an Instagram post yesterday about uh, kind of just that. But then I shortly realized I'm kind of contradicting myself because I let everybody know I pushed it through and cut it off myself. And I'm not recommending that because I don't think uh, it's the, really the safest way to do it, especially if you're working on someone else. Um you know, the, the best thing to do is ultimately get all the fishing line off of that um, and have that person rest, make sure they're okay. Um, and ultimately, you know, the worst thing that can happen is if a fish is still attached to that thrashing, subdue that fish, get it under control as quickly as possible so people can't get damage if it's attached to the fish. Um, if it's a treble hook, Try to remove the actual body of the bait from the hook so that the hook is all that's remaining um, in the person. Uh, little things like that, but you just don't know. We've got so many nerve endings and so many things that we're just not educated about that we can screw up. So don't try to be the hero, I guess, is my question or my little PSA. I don't know your thoughts, Rick, but that's kind of my belief, you know? Well, I, I, I tell you, Steve, I got one in the eye one time. And, um, yeah, had made, the actual, the actual eye, yes. I have one in the eyebrow. Okay. No, no, wow. I, I got one in the eye and made the horrible mistake of, because I made the horrible mistake of running 20 miles offshore by myself, which I promised my wife I would never do. And, uh, sure enough, a cobia slung one and slung it right into my eye and got me dead square. But the worst one, and then I want to hear your fishing report. The worst one was a buddy of mine that had to bring his boat back from Stewart back to Jacksonville. So they decided it was just him and the mate, and they decided they'd ride the Gulf Stream up. So if you're going to ride the Gulf Stream up anyway, you might as well throw out a couple lures. Well, before you know it, they've got about a 300-pound blue one jumping. They bring him alongside, and the, and the, the only mistake that they made that I never do is they had double hooks in their high-speed lures, and I just – don't believe in that. I think I think it's a disaster waiting to happen. They got the marlin alongside. Yeah. They're trying to get the hook out, and lo and behold, it buries the other hook 
in the in the mate's hands. And believe oh. it or not, believe it or not, the captain held he's got the fish build. The mate climbed overboard, okay, without upsetting the marlin, got got to where he could let himself go a little bit and just sheer adrenaline, he actually backed the hook out. And and even yeah. though it made a nasty gash in his hand, saved his life. I mean, he if that marlin goes yeah, down. Oh, that Marlin goes down, Steve, yeah. it's over. You know, so that's why I've always urged everybody fish single hooks on your big lures. You know, it's it's just so much safer because nobody really wants to you don't want to lose that hundred dollar lure and you don't want to leave that fish carrying that great big hook around. Leave yourself in a position yeah. where the hook that's in the fish can't hurt you. But Yeah, great but, tip. Great tip. Yeah. But let's talk a little fishing. How was it this week? It was great. I mean, we had what I like to call chamber of commerce weather. I mean, it was uh, light winds. Water temps are sitting in the low 70s, 70 to 72 degrees. And we've been really concentrating our efforts really out in the Gulf. We've been kind of leading up uh, to tonight's full moon. And um, the near shore bite has just been nuts. I mean, we've had the full moon, the approaching full moon, Fair, stable weather with a little bit of a warming trend. You know, it's all going to change tomorrow. But, um, you know, pre-front bite, fall bait run is in full effect in southwest Florida all the way through the 10,000 islands. And everything is in play. Last week we were talking about kingfish biting at 15 feet of water. Same thing again this week. Tons of kings up to 40, 42 inches all over the place, up to 40 feet of water from um, – setting up big time now on the near shore wrecks and reefs, Spanish mackerel, cereal mackerel, bonitas. I mean, now's the time to ultimately find, you know, those schooling fish. And they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're busting on, you know, tons of glass minnows and threadfin herring. Um, but you're not really seeing, this is where you got to trust your birds. And we're not seeing the fish kind of busting on the surface. Occasionally you see a little bonita frenzy, but, as far as everything else, we're not really seeing the thrashing. So you got to trust the birds, and they haven't they haven't lied to us in probably about a week and a half, almost two <laughs> weeks now. So following the following following them around has been pretty good. Hey. So that's in the mix. But not, but I'm happy to report that Captain Steve Dahl's favorite fish, the triple tail, is at least hitting the deck consistently in my book this past week. Outstanding. So we are, uh, that magic. Yeah, the magic number has always been that 72-degree water temperature for me, and I'm finding them um, kind of concentrated a lot closer to shore than you might think. So I think a lot of people, you know, the, the old adage, you know, the farther you go, the better opportunity you have for fish. And this crazy mindset we have as fishermen to travel, and these are right on our doorstep. So do not overlook simple things like swim buoys outside beaches, outside public beaches, um, you know, mile markers, uh, any navigation markers. There's, there's, you know, the, the lots of signage for Everglades National Park can hold them. Um, just odd, odd things. And obviously, you're, you know, there's some free floaters around there too, and obviously on the crab trap buoys, but. Uh, we're finding fish a lot shallower than we used to. My guess is with today's, uh, yesterday and today's kind of southerly wind, that's going to kind of push things up even further. So we may see even another wave of those. Uh, we're going to get a bunch of west wind, and then obviously it's going to pull out of the north. So that may push those fish out a little bit. But I think they're going to hunker down in that little warmer water, you know, that 72-degree water after we have a little bit of a, uh, cool down here, and I think those fish are going to stay put. I really do. And um, they're all good ones. They're, you know, 22 to 27 inch triple tails. Mm. These are not small, small fish. I mean, they're, they're really, really healthy, healthy fish. Um, you've heard me say before, you know, you may be allowed a certain amount. I'm only allowing one per person. Uh, people are fine with that, especially if you bag a big one. So keep that in mind. I don't know, be a little bit, you know, try to be a responsible steward of our resource and try to keep those big uh, reproducing uh, females, you know, going. Uh, it's a hard thing to do because I don't know many people that pass up a big one. And uh, I get it. I really do. It's the one fish I understand. It is such an excellent table fare. But 
um, might give someone else an opportunity to put one in the box too. So, um, you know, try to keep that in mind. But um, Rick, it's been, it's been amazing. We, I, I haven't really fished inshore. I, I can tell you from hearing reports from other captains, you know, doing really well. This little warm up gave the snook a little bit of a, a spike, which has been pretty good. The redfish are still chewing, chewing uh, on the outside points on the lower tide stages and the deeper holes are definitely still holding the trout. And, uh, but I don't have a, a refined thing. I'm going to get back to that a little bit this week, but I'm going to stick to my nearshore thing until it stops because it's uh, it's sure a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, Steve, what 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 moon phase are we in? Uh, full moon. Oh, and what's the wind going to do tomorrow? It's going to blow from the north northeast. I'll be every dumb. time. You know what? You know what? Every time. Every time it happens, I call Rick Rob. You, you, you know what? I don't even care if you answer anymore. I just say you're right, and I hang up. You know what, Gomer? <laughs> you know what, Gomer Pyle would say. Well, don't that just beat all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surprise, oh, sure. surprise, surprise. Yeah. All right. Someday the weather service will listen to me. Hey, thank you so much, Steve. Yeah. I sure hope your hand gets better. Is it feeling better yeah. today? Yeah, I'm on the mend. It wasn't all that bad. I mean, got some care. And, the, you know, the other thing, if you're going to fish regularly, try to have your tetanus shot. You know, oh, it's, yeah. It's good, for, it's good for 10 years. I mean, it's uh, not the worst shot you can have in the world. And, once every 10 years, a good, good little ounce of prevention. So, uh, mine's well within that. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. So I'm with you. Helps. Thank you, Steve. All right. Be well, Rick. You too, brother. Captain Steve Dahl from down in 10,000 Islands. Now we're going to swing around a little bit to the Southwest and check in with our buddy, Craig Stamper. I'm doing very well, Rick. How are you? I'm doing outstanding, my boy. Tell me what things are like in Southwest Florida. It's, it's cold up here in the Northeast. Well, we're, we're about to get that cold. Uh, today was, was quite nice. The wind did pick up. We we had that front just start to push through, and then tonight things are going to drop down significantly. We're going to probably lose 20 degrees in about 10 hours. So it's going to be a big impact, but we'll, uh, we'll start this week's report off talking about something that we probably won't talk about next week much is the offshore bite because the guys that did get out there this week, they had a lot of nice days, were super calm. Uh, a couple guys did some overnighters, and they, they absolutely crushed it. Every snapper you wanted from Yelltail. I saw Yelltail this week. They were 24, 25 inches. Huge Woo! fish. Yeah, just giants, Rick. Uh, mangrove snappers, they, they limited out on anything they wanted to. Uh, of course, they were out there pretty far. And even the guys who only went out to maybe the 40-mile range did, did, just did fine. The red grouper bite was excellent. There were a lot of gags out there. They're they're starting to really come in there close. I think they know something's going on. They're all they're all about to move in those shallow waters. Of course, they'll be closed, soon, so we don't have to worry about uh, keeping them and eating them. But they, you know, they're good eating fish. Yeah, ain't no doubt about that. All right, how are you guys doing on snook? And have all your tarpon left yet? It's funny you say that, Rick. So yesterday, I ran a private boat for one of my clients. We went out there. He wanted to catch some fish to eat. He didn't really have any interest in catching tarpon. He's done that with me. Uh, he has a good time with those juveniles, but he doesn't want to get beat up on those big ones. The uh, the tarpon yesterday, for me, we were out there trolling around for kingfish and mackerel, uh, which wasn't very good, actually. Huh. These tarpon were all moving south in big pods. They were, they were just breaching the water in 10, 15 at a time. There were boats that were actually like, they don't know what they're doing. They're just out there just following them with their kids throwing lures at the front of them. You know, they didn't catch nothing, but these fish are literally around these boats. They're getting pushed south and they're, 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 they're dolphining like they're a bunch of dolphins swimming south on a boat wake. It's, it's crazy. So I, I have a feeling that, um, this may be the last of that big push we've had. I think they, they know it's coming and they're going south. I'm sure down there Steve Dahl and those guys I'm sure they're seeing a lot more fish down there right now because the fish I saw were certainly moving south heading that way yep yep how about your snook snook bite was not too bad we had a little bit of a better tide nothing great you know these winter tides make it difficult for the incomings and outcomings we get a lot of those negative lows early in the morning when you get in the winter and that can make things tough the good part though is we had so much white bait on our beaches 
it was a one and done scenario, fill up your pin or fill up your live well and just go fishing. So if you got into the right areas at the right time when the water was moving, we caught plenty of them. The redfish bite just continued to be fantastic. I don't know what's going to happen in the next two days. I won't be out there. Uh, we got some winds already at 15 to 20, and it's going to be much, much stronger overnight into the uh, next eh, day, day and a half. And then, uh, you know, like I said before, the offshore guys are going to be hurt because this thing's southwest winds right now. It's going to keep moving around until it's northeast, and it's not going to slow down for four days. Yep. Yeah, that's what I've been told. That's all right. We got a little break. We got a good weekend in, so we can't complain too much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, it will be squared away by next weekend. Thank you, Greg. All right, you're good. Talk to you later. We Rick. appreciate it, buddy. Captain Greg Snapper from Snook Stamp Charters. Our right, thanks to Greg Stamper for a great Southwest Florida report. Now we're going to move into the West Central region where Captain Ray Markham is setting up shop. He's going to give us everything you need to know about fishing in the West Central region. How we doing, Raymond? Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. If I, had, if I had to pick what to do today, stay home. Stay home. Yep. A lot of days you got no one to fold them, don't you? Brother, I mean, it started out with a, a beautiful morning about, oh, 5, 5.30 with, with uh, line squalls moving through a uh, gust to about 40 miles an hour and, and heavy downpours. Uh, that was the leading edge of the front that's passing through here. Um, we won't really feel the effects of, of the cold until probably tomorrow or even probably even more so on Wednesday. So uh, as far as the immediate thing, fishing, I don't know. If, if Maybe if you were out uh, scrounging around trying to find some sheep's heads, those suckers would probably still bite, but that, they don't know any different. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It is getting to be the time of year for sheep's head, that's for sure. What do you guys use for bait for sheep's head over there? Well, most of the guys like fiddler crab yeah. um, when they can get them. But if they can't, uh, live shrimp works real well. You don't want to get hand fixed. So you want something in a small to medium size. Um, and there's also some guys that will go out and scrape pilings for barnacles on the low tide and thread a few of those on the hook. They'll chum some and, and drop some down, put it right down next to the piling and, and catch them on that. But I know a few guys that, that fish with clams and mussels and just you know, whatever kind of crustacean thing they can find pretty much. Um, it seems to work real well. So, you know, I've, I've caught a few of them on, on uh, artificial lures, caught them on DOA shrimp and uh, deadly combos and that kind of thing. Uh, but as a typical rule, I don't target them very often. I know there's guys that, that target them with flies. And the fly riders have it over most of the artificial guys because most of the things that they're tossing are small uh, imitations of a crab or something like that that they're normally going to eat anyway. So um, that's that's pretty much what they do with, with the sheep's head around here. But I'll tell you, just prior to this front coming in, the action on, on trout was pretty good. It's a lot of bigger trout are coming in late, uh, lately. And that's really good to see. Uh, because we've also been catching uh, quite a few undersized fish, which just leads me to believe that uh, there was a spawn uh, several times at least this year, uh, and that's more for next year. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking down towards the end of the week before this uh, storm moves out of here and the weather starts correcting, and, and we'll have some temperatures dropping into the 40s and possibly even 30s in some areas of the West Central region here over the next couple of days. But by by Friday, uh, we've got some weather that's supposed to be 75 degrees or thereabouts and light winds out of the east, which is good. Uh, that'll put guys out on the beach and, and a possibility of water cleaning up enough to get some mackerel and maybe some kingfish because they were just whacking the heck out of, out of kings and mackerel. And the guys that made it offshore for a grouper, um, lots of big gags, tons and tons of, uh, nice red gag, uh, red grouper and, um, uh, some snapper and hogfish. So little potpourri of everything, but right behind the clearing this, this towards the weekend, we got another front coming. So, uh, fortunately, uh, it, it's going to be a, uh, a little bit of a adjustment for some of these fish, especially snook. But um, they're going to have to go hide. <laughs> yep. <laughs> because 
because we got some cold stuff. And I don't, I don't want to see another snook kill again. No, I don't and either. I, and I don't think it's going to happen that drastic. I think it's going <laughs> to kind of work its way down there. And that's, that's fine with me. But um, yeah. I, I think as long as we stay in the 60s, water temperature wise, we're probably okay with them. So we shouldn't see that's, too sudden a drop. Well, that's good, that's, right? Are you still seeing kingfish? Uh, yes. Yeah, they caught kingfish, they caught mackerel, uh, and actually a few blackfin tuna also this week for the guys that were out beyond about 120, 125 feet. Uh-huh. Um, and that's 30, 35 miles here. So, um, you know, if, if you go further north, you need to go even farther offshore. I, I know the guys are on the shallow rocks. They're starting to see a uh, gag grouper uh, showing up in about 15 feet of water, 10 feet of water. I'm, I'm sure when you get around to... Uh, my buddy William up to the north of us here, he'll probably fill you in all by it. But, uh, yeah, it's just decent fishing, and it's typical transition, you know. Um, the fish are going to get used to uh, the changes, and, and once they do, it's a uh, yeehaw. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Thanks so much for the report, Ray. We really appreciate it. Please tell me we can check with you next week. Yes, sir. Give me a shout. You we'll got it. Fishing. Our thanks to Ray Markham for a great West Central report where he says it's getting chilly. It's going to get even chillier where Captain William Tony hangs out, the mayor of Homosassa in the Big Bend. William, are you with us? Yep, I'm right. I'm a little north of Homosassa tonight. I'm up there in the Walker Sassa River up um, toward Gulf Hammock. Well, whatever Sassa you're in, how's the fishing been? Well, the fishing's been great up till today. The gag, inshore gag grouper bite has been excellent. People have been getting them as shallow to six and eight foot on casting plugs. <laughs> also getting them on cut bait. I'm sorry, go ahead. Them on, <laughs> getting them on cut bait and also sardines and live pinfish. So after this front goes by and the wind cools down just a little bit, you know, I think the biting can get better till the end of the season here at the end of the month. Ah, okay. Hey, William, let me ask you something. What what phase of the moon we in? Aren't we in the full moon phase? Yep, absolutely. I and, think it was either tonight or tomorrow night. It was full moon, so. And we got a northeaster big, coming in. Hmm. What do you know yep. about that? And, you know, so that, that big uh, moon right there definitely gave us a big tide today. But you can expect big changes in our tides starting tomorrow when that wind switches around to the northeast. It's going to blow all our water out. So the guys with the airboats and the mud boats will be king of the backcountry going back there hole hopping. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. How, how's, yep. the, how's the backcountry been? Well, very good. You know, when you get these winter low tides, if you got an airboat or a mud boat, you can get back in those deeper holes at the head of some of these creeks that, you know, kayakers can get there, but it's a long paddle. But uh, you get back in there, it's like fishing in a barrel. So... The trout and the redfish will be back in there. Now, snook will move more toward rivers that have springs like Homosassa and Crystal River and Chazalaska because of the constant 72-degree water. But when you get these fish, it's not really, you know, the water hasn't got cold yet. We may have a frost come Wednesday morning here on our area. Hello. That's definitely going to definitely gonna drop some uh, water temperatures here, but that backcountry fishing is where it's at on the inshore side. Man, oh man, oh man, that's that's something. Frost, you can keep that right where you are. By the way, I'm not ready okay, for that I'm... yet. We'll we'll take that in February. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm not ready for it. I'm kind of uh, happy it's cooled down just a little bit. Doesn't it's going to swamp uh, rebound very quickly as soon as we get near toward the end of the week. But in the rivers too, we still got a great mangroves in our rivers on live shrimp. Getting a few trout in the river and those night snook, which are in the tonight at midnight. So, if you're listening and you really want to get a keeper snook before the season ends, you better put your boat in and have it out by midnight tonight. <laughs> and they will be checking. I hope. I'm sure they will. Hey, William, I can tell you're stomping through the woods. I'm gonna let you hike your way out. Please don't get lost, so we can talk with you next week. I, I promise I won't. I, I know my way around pretty good. As long as my uh, headlight doesn't phase out, I'll be fine. Okay. If you don't answer the phone next week, I'll send a search party. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks to William Tony for a great report from the Big Ben. Now, let's hop all the way out into the panhandle and check in with our buddy, Captain Tyler Massey. Tyler, are you with us? Yeah, Rick. I'm here. How are y'all doing? Pretty good. It's getting a little chilly out there. Oh yeah, we're we're cold over here. We're in the forties in the morning and the 
night time. It's in the fifties in the daytime Woo. this week, I think. So it's getting a little, a little chilly for sure. Yep, yep. It didn't. We didn't have much of a fall, did we? We went straight from summer to winter. Nope. Yeah, we we thanks for jumped into it. It's a little cold for us Florida people. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't like it. Put my jacket on about once a year. That's plenty for me. Tell me how your fishing's been. So fishing's been, uh, it's been getting, you know, we're definitely getting into our winter, winter patterns right now. Um, still the, the, the big redfish have been main target for a lot of the anglers fishing around in the bay. Um, with the site fishing form, the school's popped up pretty good um, this past week. Not every day, but, you know, maybe every other day the guys, the guys found them on top in the school. So that's been, uh, you know, one of the main targets for the inshore guys. That's way cool. Golly, that's fun when they get up on top like that. Anything else going on? Did anybody make it offshore? Yeah, uh, we did. We did have a couple of good days of offshore. It was the, the tail end of our little extra bonus red snapper season. Uh-huh. Um, we did, we did catch some red snappers and, you know, fishing was great for them. We, we do have an excellent fall. The bite is excellent in the fall for the red snapper. So um, that was, you know, pretty good. And uh, there's been actually uh, a few guys made it out a little further, and, and they're starting to catch a few wahoo around our edge um, and a little deeper too. So in that 200 foot to 250 foot on out to the some of the other bottom structures in a little deeper water, but the, the wahoo are definitely moving in. Oh, that's good fishing. I tell you what, that's now. How far is it for you guys to run to 200 feet? So um, it's about 28 miles or so, 29 miles yeah, to something. the. Uh, to the our 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 big drop off it goes from about 180 to about 210 and uh you know that, that's a lot of good bottom fishing there for our camp groupers gag groupers and that kind of stuff um and then also the trolling you know they're on the net you know every every five or ten miles it's another little drop off um a different little area that we have that people troll around so anywhere in that in that range is going to be uh you know decent for some some wahoo action just trolling you know, the, the typical uh, lit plugs, the stretch 30s or, or the weighted, you know, weighted wahoo lures, all that stuff looks pretty good. Now, let me ask you, do you have more guys that are bait fishing or, or lip diver type fishing uh, for wahoo out there? Or is everybody high speed trolling now? It, it's, um, you know, I, I think it's a little bit 50-50. Um, you know, the, the bigger boats, the bigger charter boats, you know, they're, they're cruising at, you know, 15 15 knots or so, a little bit more, maybe 15, 16 knots. And they're, they're just straight up high speed with their, you know, weighted plugs and, uh, and the trolling leads. I think a lot of the other guys, um, they, they'll, they'll pull the lip plugs along with some weighted Islanders or that, and that kind of stuff. Um, they do pick up a few black fins and, and other, other things. So I think, I think it's a, you know, about half and half. If people are just wahoo fishing, they'll definitely do, do a little high speed, a little bit faster. Though. I see. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, now your snapper season's over now. Yep. Yeah. It, it ended on Sunday. We were gotcha. rained out all day Sunday, so we didn't fish. But uh, we had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and and that ended up our little extra bonus, second bonus snapper season. Yep. Did you get some big fish? Yeah, we um we we didn't target any big ones. I think we had a couple ten pounders on on uh, Friday. Saturday, some of the other guys had some bigger ones, but you know we just caught our uh, our limit of keepers and then switched on the the vermilion snappers. Oh, that's fine. That's that's good fishing though. Either way, all right. So inshore has been mostly the uh, the reds having moved in, huh? Yep. Yeah, the redfish for sure. And uh, another thing, uh, like like you said, we just had our first little cold snap here, and the trout are uh, are going to be in the next the next few days and next weeks or so. Um, if it stays getting cold, the, the trout are going to move into the canals. They're going to slow down, um, you know, their, their movement. So I can move around as much and they're kind of, we kind of get them bunched up a little bit. So once you get on the trout bite, it's, uh, it's usually pretty good if you can find them. They get in bigger schools in the winter time, don't they? Yeah. They just kind of bunch up in, in the deep parts of the canals and kind of hang out, you know, not much movement. They're not traveling. Uh, they're just taking it easy. And, uh, you know, we always tell the guys that, you know, if they're asking about it, slow down your slow down your presentation, you know, slow down your retriever, your lure, uh, let your bait sit in one spot type deal. Um, so, you know, if they're not moving as fast and the baits aren't going to be moving as fast either. Gotcha. Hey, Cap, that's a perfect report. Thank you so much, Tyler. Please tell me we can talk with you next week. Yeah, Rick, I'll be here. All right, you got it, Captain Tyler Massey. 
Wrapping it up from the panhandle for us. Gosh, it's been a good week. Almost everybody got to fish this weekend. Almost everybody got to fish this weekend. The Northeast had a tremendous bite of blackfin tuna. Lots of limit catches. Lots of trigger fish for the bottom fishermen. Uh, gosh, Craig Sutton is so excited about the yellowfin tuna bite over in Nassar, Costa Rica, where they just seem to be stacking them. Jimmy Ross down in the East Central was shocked by the number of kingfish that there were still quite close to shore. Uh, this late in the season and said they're doing pretty well on blackfin tuna and seeing a few sailfish. John Earhart talked about sailfish and they're having a pretty strong mahi run down there. Gosh, you take it all the way down through the Keys and it's sailfish and mahi uh, down in Ala Mirada. Nick Stancic, of course he's catching swordfish. He's always catching swordfish. And you swing around to the Southwest, you'll find a happy Steve doll. That's because his favorite fish, the trigger fish, have shown up in number. West Central continues to be so good. The snook season wraps up tonight at midnight. There's been a lot of them caught. They're still catching kingfish there. They're doing very well on just about everything in the Big Bend region where the kingfish bite and the speckled trout bite remains real strong. The gags are in 8 to 12 feet. Captain Tyler Massey wrapped it up for us talking about schools of reds on the surface. How exciting is that? Big reds, 40-inch fish, busting the top of the water in mass, and they will eat anything you throw at them. That's some exciting fishing. So we got a little window of good weather, and that's always welcome once we get around December 1st. We'll take the days as we can get them. We got a front coming back in tonight, ironically, on the full moon phase. You know my thoughts on that. I'm always preaching it. The Northeasters bring the full moons with them. And we really want to thank you for listening tonight. We certainly want to thank Yamaha, and we certainly want to thank Tournament Master Chum. We want to thank Nassara Paradise Fishing and Young Boats. If you want the finest in flats, flats, bay, and offshore hybrids, check out youngboats.com. We couldn't do our podcast without them, but we also couldn't do it without you. So please subscribe to our podcast and pass it along to a buddy who's not catching anything. Maybe we can help him out. If you have any questions about any specific areas, you want to know during the week how the sailfish are doing down in Stewart, I tell you what, drop me a note at rick at floridasportsman.com or go to the Florida Sportsman Facebook page and drop us a note and we will check it out with our action spotters and let you know on the air with our next broadcast. So until next week, I'm Captain Rick Riles for Florida Sportsman Magazine Podcast. We'll see you on the rip.